My talk is broken up into three sections. The first section of my talk is just a bit of biographical background on Flannery O'Connor. The second part of my talk is about her specific vision of grace. And in the third part of the talk, I'm going to go through with you uh, one of her famous short stories so we can see that vision of grace uh, as, ex as it is exemplified in her writings. Okay, so section one, her life. Mary Flannery O'Connor was born on March 25, 1925 in Savannah, Georgia, right in the heart of the city's Irish Catholic enclave in a hospital run by the Sisters of Mercy. Mary Flannery was the precocious, intense, quirky, and artistically gifted child to Regina and Edward O'Connor. Little Mary was painfully shy and antisocial, but she enjoyed a rich interior life, which she brought to life in her drawings and her stories, even as a young girl. She was educated by the strict and pious nuns at St. Vincent's Grammar School, but she was not a very good student, and she was certainly not beloved by the nuns. While a devout Catholic, she abhorred traditional displays of piety and spoke disdainfully of nun-inspired doings. In 1937, when she was only 12, her father, with whom she was especially close, was diagnosed with lupus. At 13, her father moved the family to Milledgeville, the site of her mother's family's stately antebellum mansion. O'Connor spent countless hours here drawing, writing, and tending to the many birds. She attended the all-white Peabody Model School, a laboratory school that tried to embody the principles of democratic education advocated by the philosopher John Dewey, the opposite of her strict Catholic schooling in Savannah. While Mary was happy to be liberated from the nuns, she turned out to be equally disdainful of the free thinkers in her new environment. She thought that a good education depended on some concept of structured authority, and her new school lacked it entirely. Milledgeville was designated a bird sanctuary, and it was a place that seemed to suit Mary. O'Connor often expressed her inner life through her birds, which she would lovingly draw and paint. She would also often visit the 550-acre dairy farm owned by her uncle called Andalusia. In 1941, her father succumbed to lupus. She described the loss of her father in the following way in one of her letters. The reality of death has come upon us, and a consciousness of the power of God has broken our complacency like a bullet in the side. A sense of the dramatic, of the tragic, of the infinite has descended upon us, filling us with grief, but even above grief, wonder. In her father's death, the person with whom she felt the deepest kinship and affection she was still able to see the work of divine grace, but in a way that hurt rather than comforted her. Her insight that God's grace can be violent, dark, and disruptive, that it can shock one out of complacency and comfort, this would be one of the enduring themes of her fiction. In high school, Mary began to stand out for her writing. A classmate of hers once attested that being in creative writing class with Mary Flannery was sheer torture. I remember she wrote very strange stories with weird characters. Mary's early dispositions to writings about misfits and weirdos who find themselves in fantastic and often catastrophic situations would stay with her throughout her adult life as a professional fiction writer. And for this reason, she is often characterized as an example of a Southern grotesque fiction writer though the sense in which this is true is somewhat different than what her critics are likely to suggest. In 1942, Mary began to study at the Georgia State College for Women, a progressive school right there in Milledgeville. On campus, she distinguished herself for her keen sense of irony and wit, largely in her role as cartoonist for the school's newspaper. One of the formative moments of her college years was a course that she took in philosophy a survey of the great modern philosophers. The hero of the course was Rene Descartes, who saw the world as purely mechanical uh, and material, and the perspective of her professor was that of secular humanism. Mary was unimpressed with this perspective, and she took to arguing regularly with her professor, 
even, even going so far as to diagram the differences between Thomas Aquinas and the modernists on the blackboard. By Mary's lights, modernism had blinded the Western mind to the most central features of reality by its narrow focus on the material and the quantifiable and its neglect of the spiritual. As much as they disagreed on matters of substance, her philosophy professor recognized Mary Flannery's prodigious talents as a writer and as a thinker, and he encouraged her to apply to graduate school at the University of Iowa for a career in journalism. O'Connor was accepted into the School of Journalism at Iowa, but immediately upon arriving, she decided that she must meet the head of the newly formed writer's workshop there, Paul Engel. However, her Georgia accent was so thick that he could not understand a single word she said to him. He eventually handed her a pad of paper on which she wrote down the following sentences. My name is Flannery O'Connor. I am not a journalist. Can I come to the writer's workshop? Upon reading one of her stories, Engel accepted her immediately. Around this time, Mary began to sign all of her writings as simply Flannery O'Connor. Of the change of name, she once quipped, who was likely to buy the stories of an Irish washerwoman? But it was also certainly not lost on her that Flannery was a gender neutral name. She would sometimes brag that she had received rejections from journals addressed to Mr. Flannery O'Connor. As a child, Flannery had rejected the norms of Southern girlhood, which were forced upon her by her doting mother and the strict nuns. She did not enjoy tea parties and hair bows, but art and literature. And she would often pretend she was a man as a young girl, calling herself Lord Flannery and ordering around all of her friends. And it seemed plain to her that as a young author, she did not want the reception of her fiction to be colored by her gender. She didn't want to be perceived as writing chiclet. Also around this time, O'Connor began to read the great European novelists voraciously, and she began to work very diligently on the formal aspects of her craft. During her time in Iowa, she met many famous writers and poets who, pass who passed through the workshop to share their manuscripts with the students there. After her time in Iowa, she took up a prestigious summer residency at Yaddo, the famous artist colony in Saratoga Springs, New York. Here, Flannery had the solitude necessary for writing, and she set to work on her first novel. Robert Lowell, the poet, would later join her there, and he and Flannery became fast and very close friends. Lowell helped connect Flannery to prominent literary Catholics like Robert Giraud at Harcourt Brace, and Robert and Sa Sally Fitzgerald, which helped her once she moved to New York City to help advance her career as a professional writer. Flannery hated New York. Although her famous friends were happy to talk her up at cocktail parties in Manhattan, Flannery's temperament and background made her especially ill-suited to thrive there. In her letters, she writes, of just one such dreadful party at the home of a big intellectual who self-identified as a lapsed Catholic. Here is how Flannery sets the scene. Towards morning, the conversation turned on the Eucharist, which I, being the Catholic, was obviously supposed to defend. Mrs. Broadwater said that when she was a child and received the host, she thought of it as the Holy Ghost, he being the most potable person of the Trinity. Now she thought of it as a symbol and implied that it was a pretty good one. I then said in a very shaky voice, well, if it's a symbol, to hell with it. That was all the defense I was capable of, but I realize now this is all I will ever be able to say about it outside of a story, except that it is the center of existence for me. All the rest of life is expendable. After a short time in New York City and an even shorter time living with the Fitzgeralds in Connecticut, Flannery has to return home to Milledgeville for good. She, like her father before her, has been diagnosed with lupus, and she has to return to her mother, who will care for her for the rest of her life. After her diagnosis from the farm in Milledgeville, Flannery devotes herself completely to her writing, her painting, and to the hundreds of birds on her farm, including, famously, about 70 peafowl. Her first novel, Wise Blood, was published in 1952 when she was 27 years old. Hemingway's The Old Man in the Sea 
and Steinbeck's East of Eden were published the same year. Critical reactions were mixed. As was the case in high school, critics couldn't understand why her characters were so darkly comic and freakish, or why her works contained so much violence. Her publisher remarked, they all recognized her power as a writer, but they missed her point. The publication of A Good Man is Hard to Find the following year, however, secured her status as one of the great writers of her generation. In the end, O'Connor published two novels and 32 short stories. She died on August 3, 1964, while she was busy at work finishing her third novel, Why Does the Heathen Rage? Okay, so now on to section two, O'Connor's Vision of Grace. We know that Flannery had the habit of reading the 700-page Modern Library Introduction to St. Thomas Aquinas before bed every evening. She claimed that she read a lot of theology because it made her writing bolder. She was often described by critics as a hillbilly nihilist on account of the violence and the destruction in her stories. But she protested that she was, in fact, a hillbilly Thomist, that she wrote hopeful stories that centered on the work of grace in and upon the soul, thick with the promise of God's mercy and redemption. To make some sense of this, perhaps I should say something about what Aquinas thinks about the human condition. According to Aquinas's vision of man, we, like all natural creatures, seek our own perfection through our life activities. But what is distinctive of us is that we have reason and free choice. That is, we are created in the image of God. And therefore, our perfection is something that we seek through good judgment and right deliberation and sound choice. Aquinas recognizes that to deliberate well requires the virtues, stable dispositions of thought, feeling, and action that direct us to our own perfection. But Aquinas also thinks that while there are many natural created goods that are part of a good, flourishing human life, nothing created will perfectly satisfy a creature made in the image and likeness of the divine. And therefore, our natural good is ordered to our supernatural perfection or beatitude which is attained not in this life, but in the next, when we see God in his essence, or face to face. In this life, then, we are pilgrims or wayfarers. We are in exile from a condition of perfected rest and enjoyment, and we must live in the hope that we can attain a perfect fulfillment we do not yet and cannot yet possess, and that seems far off and quite difficult for us to reach. And of course, the reason it is so difficult for us is that Aquinas recognizes that we are fallen, that we have lost the condition of original justice in which all the powers of the soul worked excellently for the sake of the good of the whole person. And we now suffer from the four wounds of original sin, darkened intellects, selfish wills, weakened strength, and wayward desires. To live in hope requires grace which is necessary for us to attain the, the, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, which are necessary for our salvation. Aquinas does not think we can attain our perfected supernatural beatitude through our own hard work or merit. Rather, grace is like a gift. But like all gifts, we can receive it gratefully or we can reject it. But we must freely cooperate with God's gratuitous loving grace extended to us throughout our lives in the sacraments and without them, to enjoy eternal happiness with him, where our rational desire to know what is true and to love what is good and to delight in what is beautiful will be perfectly satisfied. O'Connor also takes from Aquinas his realism. For Thomas, what it means to live well as a human person, as a rational creature, is to know and to love reality to seek and conform oneself to what is true so that one can have loving communion with the good and take one's delight in what is beautiful. The true, the good, and the beautiful are for Thomas just different ways a person can be related to being itself or reality. And of course, God is the ultimate reality. His essence is his being, which means that God is truth, beauty, and goodness. He is the fullness of being. Reality includes both God's creation as communicative of and ordered to his own goodness and God's activity in sustaining creation in its being and working to bring it back to himself. 
the Christian must never try to hide from reality, but always to live in conformity with it. And this is very difficult for us because through sin, vice, and selfishness, we can fail to see reality as it is because we don't want to, because it's unpleasant for us. O'Connor sees that the temptation to resist, ignore, or distract oneself from reality is constant, and that the temptation is to find comfort in a state of self-deception and fantasy. It is central to her vision of grace that it works to pierce the veil of self-deception, to help us to see the world as it really is, to force us to confront reality, most especially the unpleasant reality of the effects of sin in our own souls and our need for mercy, grace, and redemption. Of her Christian realism, O'Connor once wrote the following. The term Christian realism has become necessary for me, perhaps in a purely academic way, because I find myself in a world where everybody has his compartment, puts you in yours, shuts the door, and departs. One of the awful things about writing when you are a Christian is that for you, the ultimate reality is the incarnation. The present reality is the incarnation. The whole reality is the incarnation. But nobody believes in the incarnation. That is, nobody in your audience. The idea that God's grace can help us to see reality, including the reality of the incarnation, as our redemption and salvation, is a theme of O'Connor's fiction. But it is also tied to her own understanding of fiction itself and to that of the artist as having and relating a kind of prophetic vision through her art. In an essay titled Novelist and Believer, she writes that the novelist must be characterized not by his function, but by his vision. And we must remember that his vision has to be transmitted and that the limitations and blind spots of his audience will very definitely affect the way he is able to show what he sees. There are ages when it is possible to woo the reader. There are others when something more drastic is necessary. Flannery clearly thinks that her readers are coarsened and that it would take some, some, something drastic to get them to see the reality to which she wants to point them in her art. She felt it was needed to shock her audience in order to get them to see the incarnational aspects of reality how the spiritual and the material are deeply intertwined, and how the soul depends on grace. When the audience doesn't believe in grace, the writer has a special challenge in getting them to see this central mystery of human existence. So this is O'Connor again. The problem of the novelist who wishes to write about a man's encounter with this God is how she, he shall make the experience, which is both natural and supernatural, understandable and credible to his reader. In any age, this would be a problem, but in our own, it is a well-nigh insurmountable one. Today's audience is one in which re religious feeling has become, if not atrophied, at least vaporous and sentimental. When Emerson decided in 1832 that he could no longer celebrate the Lord's Supper unless the bread and wine were removed, an important step in the vaporization of religion in America was taken, and the spirit of that step has continued apace. When the physical fact is separated from the spiritual reality, the dissolution of belief is inevitable. And I think if we meditated for a lot on that really pregnant quote, we would really understand her fiction in a deep way. Because for O'Connor, any encounter with the divine will have an incarnational aspect. It will show how the material and the spiritual, um, the terrestrial, the natural, and the supernatural are fundamentally unified. O'Connor also once wrote that she was always irritated by people who imply that writing fiction is an escape from reality. It is a plunge into reality, and it is very shocking to the system. O'Connor also insisted that morality for an artist lies in his vision, not in a lesson. So I think she would fully agree with Nabokov that great literature is not meant to be didactic, so her stories aren't for Sunday school. She once argued that if the writer is a successful artist, his moral judgment will coincide with his dramatic judgment. It will be inseparable from his very act of seeing. So 
At Iowa, Flannery learns the formal elements of her art. Her stories are masterfully crafted, and that depends on the habits she began to perfect amongst other writers and intellectuals whom she greatly respected. But what is so powerful about her stories is their moral vision. And that vision is aimed at communicating the truth through her art. And that moral vision comes from the church, and in particular in the theology of Thomas Aquinas. Judgment cannot be separated from her vision any more than nature can be separated from grace. With regard to helping her readers see this reality more clearly in all of its beauty and brokenness, O'Connor thought her southernness was an aid. So this is again from one of her essays. The South is struggling mightily to retain her identity against great odds and without knowing always quite in what her identity lies. An identity is not made from what passes, from slavery or from segregation, but from those qualities that endure precisely because they are related to the truth. And what are those qualities that the South possesses? Those beliefs and qualities which she has absorbed from the scriptures and from her own history of tragic defeat and violation, a distrust of the abstract, a sense of human dependence on the grace of God, and a knowledge that evil is not simply a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be endured. I would also say that O'Connor's vision was not simply moral, but also prophetic. The prophet has a peculiar insight into the enduring mysteries of human existence. It is a knowledge that comes by God through his grace, a kind of participation in the complete truth that is God. Prophetic knowing or revelation, which is a topic of many of her stories and especially her novels, is a matter of seeing how things relate to God, how the visible relates to the invisible and the material to the spiritual, the temporal to the eternal, and the general to the particular. This, I think, is related to the sacramental character of her vision, and thus the sacramental character of her art, which demands that she penetrate material reality in order to see its spiritual dimensions. She writes that the real novelist, the one with an instinct for what he is about, knows that he cannot approach the infinite directly, that he must penetrate the natural human world as it is. The more sacramental his theology, the more encouragement he will get from it to do just that. Okay, and I have one final quote from O'Connor about the incarnational aspect of her art. So in another one of her essays, she writes the following. St. Augustine wrote that the things of the world pour forth from God in a double way intellectually into the minds of the angels, and physically into the world of things. To the person who believes this, as the Western world did up until a few centuries ago, this physical, sensible world is good because it proceeds from a divine source. The artist usually knows this by instinct. His senses, which are used to penetrating the concrete, tell him so. When Conrad said that his aim as an artist was to render the highest possible justice to the visible universe, he was speaking with the novelist's surest instinct. The artist penetrates the concrete world in order to find at its depths the image of its source, the image of ultimate reality. This in no way hinders his perception of evil, but rather sharpens it. For only when the natural world is seen as good does evil become intelligible as a destructive force and a necessary result of our freedom? Okay, so that's a little bit about her vision of grace. And now I want to go through one of her short stories, a short, short story, uh, in order to see how this vision of grace is exemplified. And the story that I decided to choose for this evening is The Life You Save May Be Your Own. So the life you save may be, your, may be your own is the story of a poor wayfaring stranger, Mr. Shiftlet. He wanders into the lives of a poor old woman, her name is Lucy Nell Crater, and her deaf mute daughter, also Lucy Nell Crater. One evening, as the sun is setting on the horizon, Mrs. Crater is sitting on her porch in a desolate spot when Mr. Shiftlet, who only has one good arm and a tin box full of tools, he says he's a carpenter, wanders onto their property. 
Mr. Shiflet is described as a young man, but he had the look of composed dissatisfaction as if he understood life thoroughly. Mr. Shiflet is also rather philosophically minded. Immediately after introducing himself, he launches into the following soliloquy on the mysteries of the human heart. Okay, so this is from the story. Lady, he said, and turned and gave her his full attention, let me tell you something. There's one of these doctors in Atlanta that's taken a knife and cut the human heart. The human heart, he repeated, leaning forward, right out of a man's chest and held it in his hand. And he held out his hand, palm up, as if it were slightly weighted with the human heart, and studied it like it was a day-old chicken. And lady, he said, allowing a long significant pause in which his head slid forward and his clay-colored eyes brightened. He don't know more about it than you or me. In answer to Mrs. Crater's inquiries, Mr. Shiflet reveals that he's from Tennessee, although he also acknowledges he could obviously be lying about this. But he isn't interested in revealing himself to Mrs. Crater. He simply wants to continue along with his philosophical questioning. He says, really, all that matters is that he is a man. And then he asks, pensively and plaintively, what is man? Specifically, he wants to know what man is made for. He makes Mrs. Crater believe that he wants to live out in the country, where he could see the sun go down every evening like God made it to do. Now, Mrs. Crater, from the moment she realizes that Mr. Shiflet is actually handy around the house, and wants to live a simple life with an innocent girl, immediately sets out to convince him that he should marry her profoundly cognitively disabled daughter. But she insists that if Mr. Shiflet, or any man for that matter, wants her daughter, he has to stay there on her property, since she won't let any man take her away. Mr. Shiflet is clearly embarrassed by his disability, but he insists that he is handy, and even more importantly, he insists that he has moral intelligence. The old woman doesn't seem to care about this. She just sees him as a potential solution to a domestic problem. What will become of her daughter and of her home when she is gone? She's an old woman after all. Mr. Shiflet fixes nearly everything Mrs. Crater has, but it becomes clear that his real desire is for her broken down automobile. And eventually he fixes that too. At this point, Mrs. Crater gets straight with Mr. Shiflet. She proposes to him that he marry her daughter and come live with them on the property, which she owns outright. When he complains that he doesn't have enough money, Mrs. Crater loses her patience with him. Listen here, Mr. Shiflet, she said, sliding forward in her chair. You'd be getting a permanent house and a deep well and the most innocent girl in the world. You don't need no money. Let me tell you something. There ain't any place in this world for a poor, disabled, friendless, drifting man. She also offers him the car and to pay to have it painted. Here, for the first time in the story, Mr. Shiflet seems to have a purpose in mind, a reason for being where he is, although a sinister one. Once she offers him the car, Mr. Shiflet's smile, stretched like a weary snake waking up by a fire. At this point, he has decided he will marry the daughter for the car. Man, he tells Mrs. Crater, is both body and spirit. The car is like the spirit, the body is like a house. And a man's spirit means more to him than anything else. I would have to take my wife off for the weekend without no regards at all for cost, he tells her, because I gotta follow where my spirit says to go. So Mrs. Crater offers him money for the weekend, and that settles it. The next Saturday, they are married in the courthouse, but Mr. Shiflet clearly detests the entire affair. After the legal ceremony is finished, he steps outside, agitated. He looked morose and bitter, as if he had been insulted while someone held him. That didn't satisfy me none, he said. That was just something a woman in an office did, nothing but paperwork and blood tests. What do they know about my blood? If they was to take my heart and cut it out, they wouldn't know a thing about me. This didn't satisfy me at all. <laughs>
After this wedding, the daughter and Mr. Shiflet take off together in the car as planned. They want to get to Mobile by nightfall. Mr. Shiflet decides to stop to get her something to eat at a diner, where he abandons her to the boy at the counter. When the boy realizes what Mr. Shiflet is doing, he murmurs quietly, she looks like an angel of God. She's a hitchhiker, Mr. Shiflet explained. I ain't got time, I can't wait for her any longer. I gotta make Tuscaloosa by nightfall. So now we come to the place in the story where I think Grace is most active. And I'm gonna read this final page of the story um, so you can get a sense of O'Connor's writing, which my summary is not doing any justice. The boy bent over again and very carefully touched his finger to a strand of the golden hair, and Mr. Shiflet left. He was more depressed than ever as he drove on by himself. The late afternoon had grown hot and sultry, and the country had flattened out. Deep in the sky, a storm was preparing very slowly and without thunder, as if it meant to drain every drop of air from the earth before it broke. There were times when Mr. Shiflet preferred not to be alone. He felt, too, that a man with a car had a responsibility to others, and he kept his eye out for a hitchhiker. Occasionally, he saw a sign that warned, drive carefully, the life you save may be your own. The narrow road dropped off on either side into dry fields, and here and there a shack or a filling station stood in a clearing. The sun began to set directly in front of the automobile. It was a reddening ball that through his windshield was slightly flat on the bottom and top. He saw a boy in overalls and a gray hat standing on the edge of the road, and he slowed the car down and stopped in front of him. The boy didn't have his hand raised to thumb the ride. He was only standing there, but he had a small cardboard suitcase, and his hat was set on his head in a way to indicate that he had left somewhere for good. Son, Mr. Shiflet said, I see you want a ride. The boy didn't say he did, and he didn't say he didn't, but he opened the door of the car and got in, and Mr. Shiflet started driving again. The child held the suitcase on his lap and folded his arms on top of it. He turned his head and looked out the window, away from Mr. Shiflet. Mr. Shiflet felt oppressed. Son, he said after a minute, I got the best old mother in the world, so I reckon you only got the second best. The boy gave him a quick, dark glance and then turned his face back out the window. It's nothing so sweet, Mr. Shiflet continued, as a boy's mother. She taught him his first prayers at her knee. She gave him love when no other would. She told him what was right and what wasn't, and she see that he'd done the right thing. Son, he said, I never rude a day in my life like the one I rude when I left that old mother of mine. The boy shifted in his seat, but he didn't look at Mr. Shiflet. He unfolded his arms and put one hand on the door handle. My mother was an angel of God, Mr. Shiflet said in a very strained voice. He took her from heaven and gave her to me, and I left her. His eyes were instantly clouded over with a mist of tears. The car was barely moving. The boy turned angrily in the seat. You go to the devil, he cried. My old woman is a flea bag, and yours is a stinking polecat. And with that, he flung the door open and jumped out with his suitcase into the ditch. Mr. Shiflet was so shocked that for about a hundred feet he drove along slowly with the door still open. A cloud, the exact color of the boy's hat and shaped like a turnip, had descended over the sun, and another, even worse looking, crouched behind the car. Mr. Shiflet felt that the rottenness of the world was about to engulf him. He raised his arm and let it fall again to his breast. Oh, Lord, he prayed, break forth and wash the slime from this earth. The turnip continued slowly to descend, and after a few minutes, there was a guffawing peal of thunder from behind, and fantastic raindrops, like tin can tops, crashed over the rear of Mr. Shiflet's car. Very quickly, he stepped on the gas, and with his stump sticking out the window, he raced the galloping shower into Mobile. So that is the, the end of Mr. Shiflet's story. Now, in all of Flannery O'Connor's stories, there are moments of profound change, moments of grace. And grace often works to clarify the vision of her characters. It works, again, to pierce the veil of self-deception. For people who are humorously ignorant of their own defects of soul, making these defects manifest to them in extraordinary ways. And in this story, it's no different. 
Here we see Divine Grace working to make a change in Mr. Shiflet, though in a darkly comical way. He has done something gravely unjust and grotesquely selfish. He has abandoned his new wife at a roadside diner, knowing that she has no way to care for herself and that she is vulnerable to abuses and dangers of all kinds. Mr. Shiflet craves freedom, which the automobile clearly symbolizes. He is also searching for his place, searching for some purpose or meaning to his life. He wonders who he is and where he belongs and what will really satisfy him. Nothing so far in his life does. But he has also been working with a false sense of freedom, the freedom of the open road, to do whatever he pleases and not bother about who he hurts, wrongs, or exploits along the way. And yet, he has a guilty conscience, which is the source of his possible salvation. O'Connor is at her ironic best in this story. Mr. Shiflet is depressed after he abandons Lucy now. He knows what he's done is wrong, and he confesses it to the hapless young boy he picks up on a total whim, a boy who does not want to be on the road with him any more than he wants to hear his confession. The scene is dark and funny, but Mr. Shiflet seems to experience a change in his vision. When he slows down the car and confesses what he has done, his eyes cloud over with misty tears. Of course, the boy rejects Mr. Shiflet's sentimental tears and jumps out of the car, telling him he's going to the devil rather than offering him any forgiveness or sympathy. And then Mr. Shiflet asks God to purify the world, which he perceives as rotten. But perhaps what he is really seeing, if only ever so dimly, is his own need for purification and cleansing. Perhaps his prayer is really to wash away his own sins. But of course, in the end, Mr. Shiflet does not head back to his real responsibilities as opposed to his imagined ones. He is headed as fast as he can towards Mobile. He is running away from God's grace, which is symbolized by the sun and the storm. This raises the question, is the story hopeful? Or is Mr. Shiflet on the road to his own perdition? I believe we should take O'Connor at her word here and affirm that the story is in fact hopeful, dark though it is. Hope, we should remember, is a theological virtue, a mean between presumption and despair. Mr. Shiflet is searching for his place, and after this moment of genuine sorrow for his sins, which is a gift of grace, we are meant to think it is possible for him to attain it, even though we see clearly that he is not ready yet like the young Augustine in the Confessions, maybe. Like many of her stories, Flannery just leaves it open and ambiguous. She points us to possibilities, not definite conclusions. But Mr. Shiflet has been given a sign to drive carefully because the life he saved may be his own. We are not certain, we cannot presume, but we have reasons to hope he will he heed the warning when he is further down the road and we should not despair. Thank you for your attention. Well, thanks very much, Dr. Frey. That was a great lecture. And now we have some time for some questions from some of our audience joining us through Zoom and on YouTube uh, live. So uh, the first question we have comes from one of our Zoom viewers named Donald Shelton. So I'm going to read this question to you. He, s he writes, uh, thank you so much for doing this. I really enjoy your podcast. In the episode where you dis discuss Dostoevsky, and the episode where you discuss Camus, you give credence to the problem of evil as a legitimate concern, but you seem skeptical about the extent to which theodicy can hope to address it. What about Flannery O'Connor, who deals frequently with the depravity of the human heart? Does she have any response to the problem of evil in her fiction? If so, what is it? Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. Thanks for the shout out. <laughs> To the podcast. <laughs> um, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, so Theodicy. Um, I don't think that she would go in for Theodicy any more than St. Thomas would go in for Theodicy. Um, but I also think, you know, there's this quote earlier in my talk from one of her essays where she says, um, evil is not simply a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be endured. And um, that seems to me to be the correct posture 
Um, it's not that, I mean, so philosophically, the problem of evil is often posed as a philosophical problem because theologically, you know, you can come up with an answer. Um, but philosophically is, is typically where people worry and it's often brought about as an objection to belief in God. Um, and I think that philosophically um, you can make progress uh, there's actually a Thomistic Institute talk where I, where I go over evil and sin and, and how to make it intelligible. Um, but the mystery of the fallen world <laughs> and the mystery of our, of our own fallen condition um, is something that I think, um, yeah, it's, it's not something that philosophy is going to be able to completely penetrate because when we talk about a mystery, we're not talking about something that's unknowable. We're not saying, oh, this can't be solved, or we're not like throwing up our hands or something like that. Um, but we are saying that um, you could spend your life thinking about it intelligently and never exhaust it. A mystery is, is a, is a it's a kind of knowledge that, from a finite perspective, is, is inexhaustible. And I think that evil is, is like that. And I, and I have no reason to think that Flannery O'Connor uh, does not think something similar. And I think that in her fiction, she's clearly grappling with evil and sin, right? Um, I mean, every single one of her stories <laughs> is about evil and sin and grace. Um, but she, she thinks that for the human person, um, this is just the stuff of human life. It's the stuff that you have to endure, right? Um, and confront and not run away from. So, Dr. Frey, let me just follow up on that question, yeah. if I may. Sure. Uh, okay, so the problem of evil typically is posited as, uh, well, because evil exists, we see, you know, it's like you have an all good uh, and infinitely powerful God, and yet we find evil in the world. How is this compatible? With, uh, with God, or um, why would God permit evil to exist in the world, um, given that it's, you know, ha we, can, we can line up all kinds of horrible things that we, we can discover through, uh, through the sin of human beings and uh, natural disasters and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the kind of response that Flannery O'Connor, and in her fiction, uh, gives to that? I mean, because it seems like we just discover in her stories more grotesque evil, uh, and she's then holding it out to us as, as if it's um, we're supposed to somehow find God's God's saving activity in the midst of this. Um, I mean, I'm trying to be a little provocative in posing the question, but w how would you kind of tie that together? Well, because I think that so I mean, um, because I think she believes that suffering can be redemptive, and um, you know. But it also might not be redemptive. It depends on <laughs> it depends on how you respond to your own suffering. Um, but she she plainly thinks um, you know that that evil is introduced through sin, and sin is introduced through free choice. So um, you know it's and and of course it's not just for human beings. It's it's for the angels as well. And um, you know, it's it's kind of the darker side of, of being created in the image of God. Um, you know, f freedom contains within it the potential to turn away. Um, and she thinks, I had this quote in here, but I wonder if I can find it exactly um, where, where she mentions this explicitly. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be able to find it, sorry, but but, but she basically says it as much um, that, look, I mean, we have to understand that part of the intelligibility of evil is that it enters creation as a consequence of, of free choice. And, you know, the, the philosophical question of, of why God permits that, um, I don't think she, I don't think she goes there. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. I mean, we could talk about what Aquinas says, but maybe slightly off topic. Great. Well, let me uh, give you, I'm going to kind of combine two questions from different okay. viewers on Zoom uh, because both of them are kind of overlapping. 
So this is a question from Joey Belza and then another question from Joseph Natali. Uh, both are asking about uh, this term, vi the violence of grace. Yeah. So um, is that just a, a way of speaking? Is that a literary device? Uh, is violence a literary device for Flannery O'Connor? How does it have a role in signifying what grace is doing? That's, that's uh, really Joseph Natali's question. Uh, Joy Belza is asking, um, can we think of grace as being violent? Isn't that maybe, uh, for a Thomist, the wrong way to think about grace, uh, insofar as grace um, is a quality of the human being? Uh, he's asking, doesn't this make it seem like um, grace is something reified and external that's doing, um, that's doing something violent to human nature? Well, um, yeah. Um so, gosh, there was so much there. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to remember all that, so follow up with the things that I forget. But um, grace is violent in a soul that is um, vicious or beset by sin, right? So, I mean, you get, you get a similar idea just in Aristotle. I mean, you don't, you don't even have to go. <laughs> you don't have to go to Aquinas. So... Um, if you are habitually ordered to uh, bad action, you're still ordered to the good, right? Just uh, you're, you're in a disordered way. You're, you're still trying to go after the good. Um, but then what is really good um, does feel violent to you <laughs> because you're disposed in a different way. Um, and one of the things that Aristotle is really clear about in his ethics is that um, pleasure follows on your habits or your dispositions. So if you are a lustful person, um, then right, lustful actions and passions are pleasing to you. You don't feel bad about them. Um, and then if somebody's nagging you about chastity, um, or even if you're like, I don't know, you have a come to Jesus moment and you decide you need to be chaste, um, it still feels like a kind of violence to your will <laughs> because it's not, right, it's not what you're disposed to. Um, so in that sense, it, it does, um, it is a kind of violence. Now, I think for Flannery O'Connor, it's, it's usually, quite often, it's literally violence. Um, so if you think about a good man, it's hard to find. Um, the action of grace is murder. If you think about um, uh, the violent bear it away, <laughs> the action of grace is murder. Um, I mean, in the violent bear it away, it's, it's so dramatic because it's a, it's a murder baptism of a small disabled child. And you're really like, what is <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's really dark stuff. Um, but again, we have to think back for her reasons for doing this. So if you read the novelist and believer or um, some aspects of the grotesque, in Southern fiction, um, you'll see that Flannery thinks um, that she does have to distort things to get her readers' attention. Um, and there's any number of quotes where she talks about these distortions as sources of revelation. Um, so for her, part of the violence is on a part of her characters. Like, they need to be shocked out of this kind of moral complacency, this kind of grotesque self-deception. Um, but also she thinks her readers need to be shocked <laughs> into seeing grace. So she understands that her readers will not understand the significance of a baptism unless she makes it crazy, right? So she does that. She makes it, she makes it a murder baptism to underscore the point. Um, so I think for her it's, you know, again, remember that she says that her artistic vision cannot be separated from her moral and theological vision. So the choice of violence is ultimately theological. Yeah. And I'm not sure that that's against Aquinas. I mean, Aquinas has the, the same idea that, um, you know, he talks about um, the vicious person as like an addict right, and as someone who's stuck in a, in a state of ignorance and compulsion, right, um, and that's a, that's a condition that's really terrible because it, precisely because it's so hard to get out of, 
Um, and in that case, yeah, grace is like an external force, like working its, I mean, just sort of shocking you out of it. And this is a huge difference between Aquinas and Aristotle, because Aristotle thinks if you, once you get into this condition, Aristotle thinks, that's it, you know? Um, there's really, there's no hope for you. Um, but for Aquinas, even the most settled sinner can still be transformed by God's grace. Excellent. Okay, so we've got another question for you here. This also comes through Zoom. This is from Martina Suarez, who's the Thomistic Institute student chapter president at the University of Virginia. So okay. one of our TI students writes this, I've heard some say that narrative <coughs> presents truth more successfully than philosophy or vice versa. It would seem that Flannery O'Connor's work, like that of many great writers, demonstrates that narrative and philosophy work in tandem to be most successful in presenting truth. Would you say that there are situations or contexts in which one is more effective than the other? Should they even be thought of as separate ways of presenting truth? Yes. Okay. What a great question. So this is I'm, this is what I'm teaching right now. My ent my entire. Um, my entire literature and philosophy class is devoted to this question. So I, so I obviously think this is a great question. I also think it's a difficult question. Um, I'll just tell you what I think. Um, so I think that philosophy is um, a very powerful way of knowing things, but I think philosophy is also really limited, right? So there are some things that you can really only know through theology, and then I think there are other things that um, you can know through art, and one of those forms of art being uh, literature. And so, yeah, I think that they are very complementary. Um, and what I would say in a general way is that the mode of knowing in philosophy is general and abstract. So philosophers try to understand um, all the particular complicated variety and find like the most abstract principles that explain it, um, at least those that can be known solely through the use of natural reason. Um, but literature is right down there in the concrete particulars. And actually, it's right down there in the concrete particulars that things are revealed, right, which later the philosopher needs to explain. Um, and I think there's a kind of, I say that they're complementary because I think that um, Look, I think whether it's, whether it's explicit or not, I think all great fiction writers have a vision, and behind that vision is, is it our, our philosophical commitments. <laughs> um, and I think the best fiction writers are often aware of what those commitments are. Um, but I think that they're able to show things that the philosopher can't because they're working with particular characters in a particular situation um, right, they're telling a story. Um, but I would also just say, as someone who's currently theorizing about things like love and practical wisdom, literature is uh, some of the places, some of the, some of the best source material um, for thinking this through in a careful way. Um, so I think that they're complementary. I think that this issue gets really complicated really fast. Um, but I also think that Flannery O'Connor is, um, yeah, she's a kind of realist, right? So she thinks that, well, actually, we know, because she says so, um, that she follows Jacques Maritain in thinking about, um, I don't know, aesthetics theory or something. Um, and so we know that she thinks um, that art is truth revealing but sort of by way of beauty. Um, but she thinks that art is an intellectual virtue, right? That it's, it's primarily cognitive. Um, and here, like, she's following Aquinas through Maritain. Um, anyway, now I'm just rambling, so. Well, we have more questions for yeah. you, if, you if, you're, if you're game. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so we have, uh, our next question is from uh, Kathy Pluth from YouTube. And if it's the same Kathy Pluth that I su suspected this, uh, she's a former student of our faculty here from, uh, from you know, uh, some years back. She writes this, Mr. Shiftlet denies the unity of body and soul, and he acts immorally and selfishly. Does O'Connor connect those explicitly 
uh, and is there a good way to connect them in reference to the story? Wow, what a great question. Yeah, so um, I'm trying to think exactly where he he does this. He's he's um, so one of his sort of philosophical interjections that are that are constantly happening happening in the story. It's right around the time when um, Mrs. Crater is uh, basically proposing to him <laughs> uh, for marriage. But of course, the marriage is, is for her daughter. And he says, uh, yeah, a man is divided into two parts, body and spirit. Um, the body is like a house, and the spirit is like an automobile, always on the move. Um, I mean, I think that it's connected to the theme of the story insofar as like, Mr. Shiflet is searching um, he's searching for he's searching for a sense of who he is and what's going to satisfy him. Um, and he thinks that what's going to make him happy is if he can get in the car and be on the road and go wherever he pleases, right? So he's, he says that um, a man's spirit means more to him than anything else, right? Um, and here, he's clearly thinking of the spirit as freedom. And, um, you know, obviously he's not, I, I'm not sure that he's working with some theory of like dualism or something like this, but he is, he is making clear that he has a certain conception of freedom, which is a false one. Um, and I think that what's happening in the story is he's beginning to have a sense, right, that satisfying his own desires isn't making him happy. Um, and what he identifies with the body, namely a house, um, you know, if we think of house in a broader sense of like a home, a place of rest, right, then maybe he's having a sense of the spirit searching for his proper home or his place of rest. I mean, it depends on how hopeful you want to read this story, but I do think it's a story of a poor wayfaring stranger, right? Sort of trying to, trying to find his place of rest um, and you know, st still being too scared to, to really follow that all the way through. But I, but I have a sense that there is a kind of hopefulness that he'll see that, you know, the spirit does have a proper home eventually.